So basically what, I, what I'm actually talking about here is, let's say, a much simplified mathematical model derived from CrowEM. So it's actually going to be, I'm going to just talk about the, how to relate this uh, uncertain distance geometry problem to, uh, to, to yes, just to our, to the, to our simplified model uh, derived from CrowEM. So, uh, so basically from uh, this morning's talk, Professor Duxbury already introduced uh, to us the importance of this uh, on some distance geometry problem, especially in the reconstruction of 3D atomic structures. And in today's talk, I hope to, uh, well, I'm, going to I'm going to actually propose a hopefully promising result to just to solve this uh, UDGP problem, uh, at least uh, in the 1D case. And uh, I'll also just talk about how uh, the importance of, let's say, extracting geometry or estimating, or estimating geometry from, uh, from, the, from the parallel distances and, and, and its applications in, uh, let's say, in, uh, in the unknown viewing tomography. Okay. So to, to help you get a sense of what I just uh, talked about, so first let's have a look at uh, this uh, nano structure problem Professor Duxbury talked about this morning. So the essence in this nano structure problem is actually is, uh, lies within the power distribution function. So the nano structure problem essentially is a direct application of the um, standard distance geometry problem. So the nanostructure problem is actually, let's say, it tries to recover a 3D atomic structure from the X-ray diffraction patterns of, 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 some, of some powder instead of the, uh, instead of the crystal, okay? So for, for the, for the X-ray crystallography, you, actually, you basically you need to actually, let's say, grow a crystal in order to, produce, to, to just run the experiments. But this process could be uh, either time consuming or very expensive. And, uh, Getting the powder of the crystal, on the other hand, is actually could be much much easier. And in this case, the diffraction the diffraction pattern uh, is actually uh, quite different. For example, here on the on the left figure is actually the extra diffraction pattern of a crystal, and on the right here is the diffraction pattern of a powder. Okay, you can see it's actually drastically different. And uh, we from this powdered extra diffraction pattern, uh, we are able to actually extract. Uh, this thing called the power distribution function. Okay. So the power distribution function is basically, uh, you can view it as a histogram of these interatomic distances. Okay. So in this case, we are actually just uh, trying to recover uh, this 3D atomic structure based on this power distribution function. And uh, this is actually, uh, essentially, it can be just, uh, let's say, recasted as a unstandard distance geometry problem. Okay. So, so and uh, now, now let's move on to the, another different problem, which is actually crowd EM. So uh, Professor Singer just talked about, uh, okay, basically gave us a very good uh, introduction about the crowd EM, EM problem. And uh, let's see the crowd EM problem, we are trying to reconstruct a 3D structure from some random 2D projections. Okay, so I'm not claiming that I'm going to solve this crowd EM, which is a, clearly a very difficult problem. So, so I wanted to start with something simple. So I want to start with a simplified mathematical model in which I assume the 3D structure are actually uh, maybe, let's say, a 3D point site, okay? And based on this uh, assumption on the 3D structure, I can, let's say, try to reveal the co uh, connection between, the, our, my sim between my simplified uh, mathematical model and uh, the UDGP problem, okay? Okay, so, so first of all, let's just, uh, uh, just have, a, let's say, a brief review of what this unsigned distance geometry problem. So basically, in the uh, some distance geometry problem, we have, let's say, a multi-set of pairwise distances. So the dk, let's say, go from 1 up to capital K here. So, but we don't, know, we, we don't know which, let's say, which pair of points are associated with every distance in the multi-set here. Okay. So our goal here is to, first of all, uh, we want to actually recover assignment. Basically, we want to assign every distance in the, in the set D to a pair of points, and we also want to actually find the embedding of, let's say, of this of these points UN. Okay, and uh, so basically, of course, we have, there are two problems we need to solve. First of all, the assignment, and then embedding. And uh, this is actually, uh, as Professor Duxbury already explained, it's actually very difficult. So what we will be presenting here is actually uh, is going to be a robust uh, approach that actually tries to solve the 1D UDGP, which can be extended to the 2D and higher dimensional cases. Okay. 
So, okay, so first of all, in today's talk, in the first part, I'm going to be talking about the UDGP problem and our proposed approaches. So basically, we, since the UDGP itself is a combinatorial optimization problem, so we actually we recast it, uh, we actually formulate it in terms of a zero one integer programming, and then we relax it to a constrained non convex optimization problem. So, and then we try to actually just solve it with a clever spectral initialization strategy followed, followed by project gradient descent. Okay. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm then going to uh, talk about how to connect, uh, let's say, the unknown view tomography to our UDGP problem. Okay. Cool. okay, good. So first of all, this is the UDGP problem. Okay, again, let, again let's say um, in, the, in, in, uh, in our formulation, we actually assume that uh, we are working with noisy distances, okay? So here in this case, this SK corresponds to, let's say, the no noiseless distances. And this WK is actually corresponds to the noisy, sorry, uh, this, be <coughs> called, uh, this WK is actually the noisy, and the DK is the distance, our observed pairwise distances, which so clearly might contain some noise into it. And our goal is to just recover n point location UN here, okay? And, uh, this uh, problem, this UDGP problem, eventually leads to a non-convex problem, and the recovery might not be unique. For example, you know, it might be subject to translation, rotation, or reflection. Okay. So our goal is to just, let's say, hopefully we can be well able to recover the relative locations among those points. Okay. Good. Okay. So um, in our model, we are going to assume this noise follows some uh, white Gaussian dis distribution, and uh, okay, based on based on our our environment model here, the, the let's say the distance distribution we also followed a, let's say a sum of let's say the Gaussian distribution. Okay, so the, but the, with shifted means, and uh, in this case the noiseless distances S K are actually unknown, and. Uh, we, if we are, let's say, in our problem, we are, only give a, we are only given one realization, let's say, from a distribution of the pairwise distances. So um, just to, we, are, we are here are going to just, uh, let's say, have an approximation of the distribution of the pairwise distances, and we are going to use, the, this, let's say, the one realization DK to replace the actual noiseless distances. Okay, so this is actually an approximation here. And uh, so basically, right now, we have converted from we have go from, let's say, a multi-site D, we go from multi-site D to a distribution PD here, okay? So our goal is to just, let's say, find the point locations so that the estimated distribution QD is going to match our observed, let's say, also approximated distribution PD here. So the QD, the estimated QD should match the observed PD. So we're going to call this uh, distribution matching. And uh, of course, there will be, before we actually actually jump into how to solve this problem, there will be some pre-processing steps uh, we, we're going to do. So, uh, so first of step, we're going to actually quantize this D. Okay? So uh, basically, when, uh, when Professor Duxbury talked to me this morning, I actually told him, he asked me if, if, if those distances are integers. I told him, well, no, they're actually any positive real number. But uh, in fact, they are integers because uh, uh, so basically, D is at any positive real number, but I perform the quantization. So eventually, what I work with is actually called Y. So Y is actually an uh, integer. Okay. So the, this delta D is basically, let's say, the quantization uh, step size. Okay. So this actually, this is, uh, I mean, by doing the quantization, inevitably, we're actually introducing quantization errors, but this is something we can control. Okay. And, uh, and, and then again, also in order to perform this distribution matching, we also perform, after the quantization, we also perform a discretization of this distribu distribution. Okay. So go, we go from the PD up to, let's go, go to PY. So in the end, eventually we're actually trying to compare the, let's say, uh, the estimated QY with this, uh, with this quantized and dis dis uh, discretized PY here. Okay. Okay. So feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions or I'm not, I'm not, I'm not clear about anything. Okay, good. So first of all, I want to talk, uh, talk about this 1D UDGP. So I'll start, start, let's start with something very simple, okay? 
So that actually is a 1D UDGP, uh, although it's actually simple, but uh, like it actually has a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, applications in computational biology. Okay, so one of the applications that it, it is this partial digestion problem. I think it's called partial digest problem. Oh, <laughs> partial digest problem, yeah. Partial digest problem, thanks. Okay, so basically in this case, we are trying to, uh, let's say given some DNA molecule DNA strand, there are a bunch of, let's say, some restriction sets whose locations we want to actually recover. And in this case, pro through a partial di digest the digestion uh, process, okay, so this DNA, this DNA strand will actually just, let's say, cut off at those restriction sites. Let's say uh, U2, U3, U4, U1, and U5 are just those two ends. So because this is actually a partial digestion, so um, in an ideal case, let's just assume that all of the, the, this DNA strand was actually digesting the, in the perfect way in such that uh, all of we actually have, uh, let's say, a fair amount of, let's say, uh, we eventually we have ended up with those uh, DNA fragments corresponds to any two, any uh, pairwise distances between, let's say, the U1 up to U5, okay? So in this case, the day we can actually mirror the, the length of those fragments corresponds to the pairwise distances between those restriction sites. And our goal is just to recover the, let's say, the location of, of those restriction sites, U2 up to uh, U1 up to U5, okay? So this clearly is, again, it can be posed as a one-dimensional UDGP problem, okay? So another one-dimensional UDGP problem is actually also more well-known as a turnpike problem, okay? Suppose that actually, well, if, if I'm going to, let's, let's say, if I'm going to go from UIUC to, let's say, to Rutgers University, if I'm driving, which, which luckily I'm not, where I'm going to, imagine I'm going to go through a toll road, there will be, let's say, uh, some toll station that I need to pay. And uh, supposedly, it, and uh, what I, let's say, suppose that I can only know the, let's, the, let's I can only mirror the distances between any two toll stations, okay? And my goal is actually just uh, after I took this trip, I want to actually reconstruct the locations of those two stations based on the pairwise distances between the, let's say, between any two two stations, okay? So, and this is actually also known, known as a turnpike problem, and it was actually, it actually despite, despite maybe two, up to, uh, maybe up to 40, maybe, maybe I think, uh, maybe 50 years ago, uh, this, they actually detailed, analyzed uh, in, in the dark acres, in, 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 in dark acres uh, thesis. And uh, so those are just two of the motivation applications that we can find for this one-dimensional UDGP problem. And, uh, and there are already, people already uh, proposed a lot of uh, approaches to solve it. Okay, for example, there's this uh, polynomial factorization approach and proposed uh, by Lackman and Warman back in 1988. And uh, the, one of the disadvantages of this approach is that it only works with noiseless measurements. Okay. And a second approach is actually, which is a, a more practical approach, which is also the, pr the approach we are going to be comparing against in our talk, which is called backtracking approach. Okay, so uh, this basically is kind of a, it can be viewed as a, a branch and pruning algorithm, and uh, it, however, because because it actually performs this kind of backtracking, and uh, there are there are certain cases this algorithm actually could take an exponential time to finish. Okay, and. Uh, Oh, and also, when, if there's noise in the distance measurements, it could also, uh, the algorithm also becomes a bit way too complicated and way too slow to finish. And, okay. and uh, for the third uh, main approach uh, is actually pr is proposed by Dakik in her, in her PhD thesis, which is a, a semi-definite programming formulation of the 1D UDGP problem. Okay, so one, basically, of course, since this is semi-definite programming, it actually has some uh, memory requirements and which actually limits its, uh, you, let's say, applicability for those large-scale problems, okay? So hopefully, uh, the, the approach we pro proposed here today, it might actually offer a more robust solution and address those uh, drawbacks of previous uh, approaches, okay. okay? Good. So uh, uh, because this backtracking approach is uh, the approach we are going to be comparing against, so let's just, let's, um, just first, let's just play, uh, try this toy example just to give you guys uh, just a rough understanding about how this approach works, okay. So basically, we are given a multi-site D, I'd say it contains some uh, unlabeled or uh, unsounded pairwise distances. For this backtracking approach, okay, so it relies on the, I would say it relies on the largest uh, distances in the multi-site D 
to determine the location of the, to determine the point locations. Okay, so it's 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 actually analyzed in the in the in the, in in the, in in, uh, in Skinner's paper back in 1994. So uh, here I would just describe it okay, first. So first in the first step, because this is actually a 1D problem. So based on the largest distances, we can actually have the two anchor points. Okay, basically U1 and let's say U4. And then after we have two anchor points, we're going to re be removing those two anchor points from the, from the distance set, distance set because, the, because they're, they are they're already being assigned to a pair of points. And in every step, after we, let's say, after we find the location of our points, we are going to have a bunch of distances that, actually, that can actually be assigned uh, to us to those, any two points. And uh, basically, we are actually be performing an iterative approach. Okay, so in every step, We'll be finding a location, let's say, trying to decide the location of a certain particular point. After that point is decided, we're going to be removing some distances from this D, from this multi site, okay? because, they, because they, already, uh, they, are, they are already being associated with a, a pair of points. Okay? And then, based on the next, based on the left uh, distances, we're going to repeat this process. Okay? Basically, it's actually like a trace structure. And, uh, and the backtracking approach is actually it means that actually eventually you because you don't know which point location is the true one, eventually when you actually let's say go from the root up to the let's say one of the leaves, sometimes you will you will realize that actually this is the wrong way. So in this case, for example, if you took this path, it leads you to the wrong solution. So you're going to be backtracking. For example, in this case, you're going to be backtracking to the previous step. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. So, and then you're going to be backtracking to the previous step, and then hopefully, eventually, and you will be able to actually arrive the, at the correct solution. Okay, so basically, this is how the backtracking approach works. And you can imagine that actually, this is actually uh, works definitely pretty well for those uh, noiseless uh, distances. If you, if you have noise in your environments, let's say in your distance environments, the location you, you will not, let, let's say, have two branches go, going, from, going from every, let's say, uh, going from every parent branch. You might have maybe four or five, maybe, maybe even ten branches coming from every every parent branch. Okay. So, so next we are going to uh, talk about uh, our, our proposed approach. Okay. So uh, this UDGP itself, uh, as I have mentioned before, is a combinatorial optimization problem. And those, uh, some, for some of the combinatorial optimization problem, that can be formulated as a let's say a zero one integer programming. Pro and uh, in this case. We are going to just based on this integer programming. We are going to perform a relaxation, and then we are going to uh, uh, recast it into a non-convex optimization problem and try to solve it. Okay. So first, let's start with how to actually perform this zero-one integer programming formulation of this UVGP problem. Okay. So, but uh, first of all, you know, what we are going to actually perform a discretization on the one D domain. Okay. So basically, for example, suppose we have a LAN segment, okay, this L here, okay, we are going to perform a discretization on this LAN segment L. And of course, every LAN, uh, we are going to assume that we are performing, uh, let's say, the, uh, the discretization, actually, this, uh, let's say the, the unit step we actually we are performing, the, we are using to perform the discretization are the same, okay. So, and the, after that, we perform a discretization on a 1D dimensional space, we can actually we can actually get an indicator vector x out of the locations of the points. Okay. Suppose that right now where there are actually the, the L1, Lm, and L capital capital M, those are the points located in, in some of the LAN, smaller LAN segments. Okay. So in this case, the <coughs> indicator vector is actually, is actually a vector. It also contains it, every entry of this indicator vector corresponds to one of the LAN segments. Okay. So in this case, if one, if one of the points are located in one of the smaller line segments, okay, then the entry in this uh, indicator vector it will, will be actually corresponds to one. If it's actually, if there are no points located in some of the segments, the, let's say the corresponding entry in the indicator vector x is going to be zero. Okay. So basically in this case, after the discretization, the indicator vector actually can, we can use this vector x to represent the point's locations. Okay. So, and, uh, and after we actually represented the point's locations uh, this way, okay, 
I'm going to first just to give you the results and when we actually just uh, to just uh, to go through it step by step to understand why this makes sense. Okay. So basically, after the discreditation and uh, after the discreditation and uh, and, uh, and the use of this indicative vector, we are able to actually give the pairwise dist distribution a quadratic form. Okay. So basically, in this case, it's x is our previous indicator vector. This ay is some is some, uh, I would, here I'm going to just refer to it as a measurement matrix. And uh, basically, f basically the di pairwise distance, distance dis distribution has a quadratic form, let's say, uh, in terms of this indicator vector x. Okay, so, and uh, for and this indi indicator vector, oh, sorry, this uh, measurement matrix a y actually have um, a very special structure. So in here, so we actually, uh, I'll just give you uh, just a rough idea about this, what AY, this AY looks like. So basically this AY is, looks, is just basically a zero one matrix. And uh, we're going to like next, we're going to just see how to actually, how, uh, how to actually just get to this, this matrix uh, AY here, okay? So again, so just like the indicator vector, which is a zero one vector actually, we can use that to represent the, let's say the points locations. This environment matrix AY, we can use it to represent, let's say, the relationship, uh, let's say, the relation between any two line segments. Okay. For example, uh, basically, if for example, basically every row. Okay. So let's just start to look at every row corresponds to uh, every row of every column corresponds to one line segment. Okay. So, but let's just first look at this uh, first row. And uh, for example, the first row L, the first row here corresponds to the first row. Uh, uh, let's say line segment L1, it actually, it actually describes the relationship between us, uh, basically, uh, it actually talks about the relationship of whether or not the distance is from L1, let's to L2, L3, L4, L up to L5, has a, uh, has a distance of, of, A, of two, okay? So the A2 basically can be derived from the distance matrix, okay? So first of all, let's say, suppose that we we have we first compute the dis distance matrix uh, of those uh, of those five line segments, and then suppose we want to also want to actually find out uh, how to construct the measurement matrix A2. Okay, so basically at those let's say at those positions L1 actually have is actually separated uh, at a distance two from this uh, this line segment L3, and uh, eventually eventually we can actually just mark out all of the positions actually corresponds to the distance equals distance distance two. And uh, then in, and then we are going to just set those distances actually entries in the we are going to set the entries in the distance matrix whose values actually equals y to y uh, to one and set the rest to, to zero. So in this case, by just reading by just reading the first row, we know that actually the L3, this line this line segment, the, the third the third line segment is actually at a distance two from the L1. And also by reading the second row of this measurement matrix A2, we are able to tell that actually, we know that L4 is actually at a distance two from, from, L, from, A, from L2, okay? So basically, by just looking at, at this measurement matrix, we are, able to, we are able to actually just tell, let, let's say uh, for, for, for a particular measurement matrix A2, we are, going to, we are able to tell, let's say, uh, let's say the, the, the distance is between any two line segments, okay? So after we actually, just uh, constructed the measurement matrix A2, we are able to, let's say, compute the frequencies of the pairwise distances in the multi-site, okay? So here, suppose that I will also have a, some kind of a, a three, suppose we have three points located in on this line segment, and uh, we can actually get the indicator vector to be 11001, zero, zero, one. and what is X transpose times A2X? So this is actually the, Twi equals twice the frequencies of this d equals two in this uh, let's say in the multi-site d, okay. Basically, just by actually performing uh, just by computing this term, we're able to tell the frequencies of this of some particular distance value. So this can be converted into the pairwise distance distribution, okay. And uh, so if you actually want to actually just work it out, it's actually pretty simple. And uh, basically, this is going to be our distance measurement A2, this measurement matrix A2. And this is X transpose X. And uh, of course, you can actually, uh, eventually after normalization, you're able to get, uh, get the probability distribution when the pairwise distance equals two, okay? So any questions? Yes. 
Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, as an input, you have a list of distances. Yes. And uh, are the distances the L? The, the distances uh, are, we, we actually perform a, quant, let's say, quantization on it first. Basically, it's a bunch of, it's a bunch of integers. So, and, uh, in, and in this case, the distance where, okay, so I would say. The L's, what, what do the L's mean in terms of, oh. in terms of the distance? Okay, so you mean the L? So L, L corresponds to a line segment, for example, because we are performing a 1D discretization. So, for example, L1 corresponds to the first line segment, and L2 corresponds to the second line segment. And, uh, and this distance, uh, this environment matrix A2 here, I think it actually describes, uh, let's say, how far apart are those uh, any I two. But mm. I, I, didn't, I don't understand how the input relates to the line segments. Oh, okay. So, okay, so the input, um, I would say, okay. So, okay, so basically, it, because, um, oh, okay. So basically, if you actually compute, uh, let's, let's say, this, uh, this, this, this product of here, so eventually, it's actually going to be let's say, about multiplying this x1, x, x3, x2, x3, x up to up to x5, x3. Okay, when x what, this is going to be one, if and only if there are, there are actually two points, at, 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 let's say at x1, x3 at the same time, and uh, if they are both one, it means that there are actually two points separated uh, at a distance two in the let's say in 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 the original uh, okay. in the equation here. Okay. So okay. The two would be represented by that sum being one on account of only one of those products. Uh, yes, yes, that's one one of the frequency. All right. yeah. And uh, and in fact, this uh, this quadratic formulation can also be interpreted uh, <laughs> as a okay can also be interpret, interpreted as a, let's say autocorrelation analysis autocorrelation. Okay, so basically, if you actually look. Let's say uh, we only focus on the product of this a two times x. It's going to be just uh, let's say this, this part is going to be just a shifted version of this original signal x, and this part is also going to be a shifted version of the original signal x. So when you actually perform the compute this quadratic formulation, it's going to be uh, let's say just uh, uh, you actually perform the autocorrelation operation here. Okay. So uh, I would say that. Uh, in the and then in the further way, I can actually relax this integer this uh, integer constraint into let's say in, into into the constraint so that uh, into a continuous uh, uh, so that the every entry in the indicator vector is between zero and one, and this are also going to be sum up to n, okay, in that in the noisy case, and uh, after we actually perform the relaxation, we can show that actually in the noisy case this doesn't change the location of let's say the solution of the global of the global optimal solution. And I think I'm going to skip the 2D. So 2D, 2D case. So for the 2D case, we can, we it's also we can also just extend this discretization and approach in the 2D case. I'll just um, okay. So I'll, I'll also mention that uh, the formulations are actually the same, okay. But the only difference is actually lies in the environment matrix, and uh, and eventually we uh, we can actually just uh, let's say before before because we are going to be performing a distribution matching. And in this case, we're going to be this x transpose a x is going to be our environment corresponds to the pairwise distance distribution, and this z t z is actually the locate the let's say the, the vector we are trying to recover or the signal we are trying to recover. So we want to actually make sure that the square error between the between the environments and our z t z a z t a y z actually is minimized subject to these two constraints. So basically, now we actually formulated this problem in terms of, uh, let's say, in terms of non-constrained non non-convex optimization problem. So the, one of the advantages of choosing this quadratic formulation of this problem is that uh, we would actually adopt a, adopt a spectral initialization strategy. And uh, we can also, for e, just in order to actually satisfy for the problem, uh, to satisfy those two convex constraints, we're going to be using projected gradient descent to, just to, uh, to solve it. Okay, I'm just... Uh, Introduce this spectral, spectral initialization really quick. Okay, so basically the spectral initialization was originally proposed for the phase retrieval problem, in which case there are a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, constraints that you need to impose on the environment vector. 
So our problem is actually different from the, their, their problem because our problem uh, is our, dis our environment matrix AY is actually deterministic and uh, it is also high rank. And in, in this case, we cannot directly use this spectral initialization strategy. Okay, so we have to actually modify it. And, uh, okay, so, and, uh, and eventually, we can, eventually this, we can actually just also um, inter, we, uh, we can also interpret this uh, in spectral initialization in terms of, well, let's say, in terms of solving, a, in terms of this uh, semi-definite programming. But uh, in this case, we are, we are actually just relying on semi-definite programming to, to give us uh, a, a initializer, okay. Uh, and this is actually the projected gradient descent. So uh, I just also want to just show, show very quick about the experiments, okay. So the experiments, uh, we actually compared our proposed approach with a backtracking approach. And uh, in term, when they actually, well, when there are only 10 points to recover, to, to recover we can see that uh, or, or basically uh, we, when, the, when the noise level is high, our proposed approach is actually perform, uh, is more robust compared to the backtracking approach, which is P is cores, B, uh, B corresponds to the backtracking approach, and this P is our proposed approach, and uh, this E corresponds to the exhaustive, exhaustive search, so which is actually the best you can hope for to achieve. And this is the case when N equals 10, okay? And when N equals 100, we are also able to, we are actually, in this case, performing an exhaustive search would be, become virtually impossible. And we, in this case, we, can, we only have the result to compare our proposed approach with the backtracking approach. Um, the, in this case, I would say, uh, you can see that actually, as when, the, when the noise level is small, the backtracking approach can work, but uh, when the, we actually increase the noise level, let's say, uh, the backtracking approach completely breaks down. Okay. Okay, so, yeah. So the next. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> questions? I know you, you had a minimization yeah. objective function. Does that distinguish between possible multiple solutions? Uh, so I would say the we have um, we actually, in this case, we are actually directly trying to apply, optimize the over, we are trying to recover the points locations jointly. So in this case, so what, what we got, what we recovered in the end is either, let's say, hopefully it's going to be a vector with entry values between zero and one. And then based on, let's say, based on the every entry values, we can actually determine the locations of the, of the points. Yeah. But does that have to be unique if there's many solutions? Oh, we, we eventually we will, we will just we arrive at a one, one feasible solution. So, so I will click. So basically, I'm planning to in my second part of the talk, I was going to say that. Uh, uh, so, we actually can uh, uh, extract some uh, autocorrelation, uh, let's say, rotation environment features, which in, includes uh, the autocorrelation feature and also the radio features. Basically, the autocorrelation feature is actually will be we, under the point source model. This autocorrelation feature actually uh, corresponds to the, our pairwise uh, distance distribution. And uh, this uh, radio feature corresponds to, uh, let's say, the radio distribution, uh, radio distribution actually of the distance. Uh, uh, okay, I would say the dis radio distance dist distribution. Okay, so for example, this PO, suppose this P here, it's going to be, a, let's say, a, there are three points located in the 3D space. And, uh, and this HS is just the autocorrelation of this PO, which is with itself. And if you then perform an integration on this autocorrelation function, and then you actually arrive at this uh, pairwise distance distribution. So this is your PD here. So this is actually based on the second order moments of the Fourier transform of the original 3D density distribution PO. And this is actually the radio distribution. And uh, eventually, we, are, we, actually, we can actually solve, uh, we, can, we can try to solve the, uh, let's see, this, uh, this is also a non-convex problem based, based on those rotation environment features we have extracted. Of course, with the help of, uh, say, I would say, one of the 1D projections. Uh, any other questions? We have time for one or two more questions. Yes? Uh, do I understand correctly mm -hmm. that the output of the probability is the probability distribution, the quantized probability 
Oh, yes. So, mm. so then how do you calculate the error because you're showing the by reconstructing error? Is it kind of thresholding and oh. like taking the highest? Yeah, so basically, I would say uh, the, the indicator vector in the, in the noise case, the indicator vector we have, uh, I would say, after we, the indicator vector in the noise case, we, uh, after the reconstruction, sometimes we actually get uh, uh, something like this. Okay. So most likely, because we actually assume the Gaussian dis distance distribution uh, of, for the noise, and we also in, the, in our simulation experiments, we also run the, we also run the, we also choose the right Gaussian noise. And the, the indicator vector we, in, we eventually extracted actually, let's say, a bunch of, let's say, a, a bunch of uh, Gaussian blocks. And based on, let's say, supposedly based on the, let's say, the highest uh, uh, points location of this, uh, let's say, the peaks, we can actually decide the locations of, our, uh, of the points. So, and I also want to mention, we also tried, that, uh, based on what I showed the, for the results, uh, for the experimental results I showed here, it's uh, our simulation, by the way, but we are able to uh, test our algorithm on, let's say, on, the, on some real genomic data to perform the partial digest experiments. But that, but that data is actually, however, it's actually uh, noiseless data. Okay, so this is, uh, this, uh, this one, for the noisy experiments, are all pure simulation. And uh, I was here, the results here is actually the, the 100 points. We, we also tried to, uh, the cases were, uh, were n equals 500. And basically, that's the largest number of points I have tried. And it's still the, uh, the, the, uh, our proposed approach still works in that case. It's actually, but it's, took, it's going to take very, very a long time to finish. For example, in this, when n equals 100, we have 100 points. We, we can take about maybe, uh, maybe three hours to finish, but n, when n equals 500, it might take, uh, I would say, half a day to finish, so we didn't actually run the batch experiments on that. Okay, thank you okay. again. Thank you very much. Thank you.